So we are here today with Matt Larkin, who I believe is the author of was the Era of Ragnarok series that I found. Gods of the Ragnarok Era. Gods of the Ragnarok Era, yes. So what fun. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're working on at the moment, and then we'll get into your previous works a little later. Okay. Um, well, I, I write uh, retellings and reimaginings of mythology and folklore as um, as fantasy, as dark fantasy. Okay. Dark fantasy, if you prefer. Uh, so what I'm working on right now is a Greek mythology inspired series set in the the same universe as as my other works, mm -hmm. which is uh, collectively called the Eschaton Cycle. Okay. Fun. Now retellings. How far from the original are you going? Uh, it varies from, from case to case. Um, sometimes I change things um, because the original myths are um, too silly for, for a serious retelling. Uh, sometimes I change things um, because there are conflicting accounts and I just have to pick one. Mm. Um, or there's there's missing information, or I, I just need to make everything fit into a cohesive story, uh, right. which, which may mean uh, adjusting certain things um, to create a, a more resonance um, for the reader. Okay. Uh, often myths, you know, evolved over hundreds of years from the cultures telling them. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of different versions and the stories weren't all, they were never all intended to fit together. And when you're right. trying to fit them all together, you have to make some changes to make it feel like a single cohesive tale. Okay, interesting. Which then brings up the question, how much research went into this? Because if you're looking at the development of the myth over culture, I imagine that would probably require a lot of research yeah a, a lot um i on this greek project i guess i've been um so i do this i do this full-time i'm a full-time writer so when right. i say that i am that i am um doing nothing but research on the greek project uh for three or four months i mean full-time seven days a week doing nothing but research uh, oh, so um it, it is a really intensive amount of research to try to do this. Yeah, I can imagine that. about it, so uh, I, I enjoy the research uh, almost as much as the writing. Yeah, I can imagine that too. Sometimes I feel like my head's going to explode from trying to reconcile so many different things. That's well, I mean, that is mythology. That is the nature of the mythology. It doesn't tend to be terribly um, coherent. Yeah, especially when you're trying to reconcile um, multiple th mythologies, because as I said, they, they all fit into the same universe, different eras in the same universe. Ah. So, uh, they, they have to play nicely together, and they don't always do that. So. Ah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know of a whole lot of mythologies that tend to play nicely together. So how does that work? Uh, I, the Eschaton cycle is divided into multiple eras. Uh, within each era, usually I have several um, cultures or mythologies that inspire that era. Mm -hmm. and there's a little bit of stuff that tends to carry over between eras. Um, some entities may be immortal or there may be ruins of something that was left behind in the distant past or whatever. And so you can see some references. So... Um, the Greek mythological stuff takes place before either the Polynesian or the Norse stuff. So mm -hmm. scattered throughout, you'll see occasional references to something that happened in the distant past. And usually the people aren't aware of exactly what happened. They just have some idea of that. Now, if you look at the Ragnarok era, there you've got, it, I focus mostly on the Norse mythology, but there's a little bit of um, German stuff and a little bit of Finnish stuff. And... I think you could probably imagine how those fit together a little better than uh, some other things. A little bit. Yeah, so, um, you know, some of the, the German stories uh, have some overlap with the Norse mythology already. And in Norse mythology, there, there are stories of um, the, the Norse, of course, interacting with the people in Finland. So right. it's not too hard to 
um, slide in a few characters from Finnish mythology uh, in there as, you know, guest stars, if you will. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's always fun. Now, I did note um, that you started writing your series with the Ragnarok era, which is interesting because isn't that the whole, you know, end of the world type of thing? Uh, it is the, the Norse end of the world, yeah. Um, it, it's called the Eskatan cycle because each era of the world goes through this this cataclysm and rebirth. Ah. So that it, it's a it's a cyclical um, destruction and rebirth uh, idea uh, drawn kind of from Buddhism. Oh, interesting. Interesting. And there's a whole other um, set of ideas and ideologies that don't necessarily... <laughs> Aligned with some of the mythologies. Great fun. My um, my original educational background uh, was in philosophy, uh-huh. so some of those ideas come out. But then I, I personally studied a lot of uh, mythology, um, so Gnosticism and, and Buddhism and uh, Manichaeism uh, kind of came up with the foundations uh, for for the system. And when I actually first started writing, I was working on an Indonesian. Um, fantasy series, which I, I've taken down for now uh, to focus on um, the Norse. And I got, to, like, there's 15 Norse books out, and I have uh, three um, Polynesian books out. The okay. Polynesian ones take place before the Norse ones. But I, I finished the full 15 um, Norse books, which are two intertwining series. And, and then I started working on the Polynesian ones as a prequel, and now I'm working as, uh, on the Greek ones, which are also, I guess, prequel to everything <laughs> yeah you know it's just well there's ooh, there's really not a good word for a prequel to a prequel I'll work yeah. on that. uh so yes um the the ragnarok era that that time period is the farthest in the time period that i have written so far i i don't okay. want to say too much about the possibility of what would happen after because that's no, no. sort of the ending so that would, yeah, we don't want that. That would be um, unfortunate. Okay, so. Oh, the- I, actually, I will make one more comment. In Norse mythology, um, Ragnarok is often considered to be a cycle. It's uh, right. there, there was a world that would persist after that. Some of the gods would come would around, persist. and possibly the whole thing would happen again. Right, um, naturally. Yeah. Always fun. Because who doesn't want an endless cycle of uh, potential death and destruction? Right. So taking these mythologies and turning them into a fantasy series, though, how was that? Because, okay, you talked about the whole coherence and cohesiveness of the piece, but I imagine there was a bit more that went into it. Well, gosh, yeah. I mean, I've been working on um, w- working with myths and studying them for for so long, uh, and this this project has gone through so many years and so many iterations um, that it would be difficult for me to say exactly uh, where where it began. I mean, I was um, in love with fantasy from my childhood. Right. So I was pretty much always a writer, always telling stories. Um, you know, I think it was in, in first grade and I had us writing these, these little, you know, books that are a handful of pages. I mean, my first one was a, a fantasy book, uh, huh? you know, some guys killing a dragon. Um, I'm sure I had the Hobbit rolling around in, in my mind. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, so I I, I would say that uh, the Eschaton cycle kind of represents the culmination of um, m- multiple iterations of uh, interest in mythology and fantasy. Okay. Interesting. And, um, okay. Yeah. Maybe it's related to your question, but I have always taken it that the the myths didn't evolve in a vacuum. They evolved um, because of the cultures that they came from. Right. So um, most of the cultures that you see in my world it, are um, rough parallels to real cultures. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of like you see in um, Guy Gabriel Kay, if you're familiar with his work, um, where, you know, these people they are obviously uh, Scandinavians and these people are obviously, um, you know, from Gaul 
and and there are some differences, uh, you know. But you, by and large, you you, you can be uh, pretty uh, apparent to the reader. Right, right. That's always fun. I, but I do see in a lot of fantasy stories them taking myths and um, twisting them to sort of fit the scenario. I imagine you probably went the other way around. Uh, a bit of both. Um, sometimes, um, you know, some sometimes you try to take creative license and, and be clever and say, hey, look, I just <laughs> told this myth and, and everything's there, but you didn't expect it to come that way. Right. Um, and, and, yeah, sometimes, um, usually I, I, the myth is a starting point, and, and uh, so I, I'm building up from there, and I, I, I've got my characters, and they have some kind of a personality from the myths and um, then I have to take them and, and expand upon that and um, the, the other thing uh, when you're working with with a any novel but a big project especially you're thinking in terms of theme and right. what is the uh, what is the feeling you're trying to get across and, and that may cause you to want to make certain s small changes and, and some of the changes that I made uh, who was related to who, and 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 in what way, um, uh -huh. have to do with the portrayal of certain themes. Okay, that's I'm very curious now, because, well, a lot of the who is related to whom situations in I don't care which mythology you pick tend to be hmm, unusual. <laughs> it, yeah. Um, Interesting. It, yeah, Indo-European mythologies all tend to have a lot of um, de densely interrelated families. <laughs> yeah. 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 Although, to be fair, many of the uh, uh, Egyptian mythologies, as well as similar in the region, tend to also have the same problems. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I do know some about uh, e Egyptian. Uh, that's that's not an area that I've gone too deep in. Uh, so a little bit, not 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 a super deep dive as much as the Indo-European stuff and some oh, sure. Asian stuff. Right. Maybe you know, far out in the future. Yeah, I mean, I have to. Um, as I mentioned, each one takes an enormous amount of research, each era, so I have to be very choosy about where I'm going to go. And right. if, if my Gods of the Ragnarok era uh, was an example, it, you know, if it took nine books to fill out that series, and I want to do that for every era, then that's a big project uh, ahead of me. So, touch. Yeah. Yeah, so I can't necessarily... Um, represent everything that everybody could ever want you know I, I get requests sometimes can you retell this mythology or that mythology and you know my answer is always you know I'd love to do that someday but I, sure. I don't know I don't know I mean uh, you know every single one represents a big investment of time I can only imagine uh, three or four months of research is rather significant but then I tend to um, create worlds that don't have basis in previously created cultures yeah in, in my my off time i um i write sci-fi with a collaborator so that's um it's kind of refreshing i mean i bring in some of my sure. philosophy but it doesn't it doesn't require a whole lot of research so our, our planning stages um instead of months is you know maybe a, a couple of weeks to plan a series right and, um it, it's refreshing because you just plan it and you sit down and you uh you know, you crank it out. So I, my first passion is doing this mythology um, and, and these tales that, that mean so much to me. And mm -hmm. I, um, but it, it's nice to do something else for change. I think Although, the reason I want to do so much research, though, is I want to always be respectful and um, representative of, of, of the stories. Right. You know, they, they, mean, they mean something. That's why they've endured for all this time. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that if I am making a change, uh, I know that I'm making that change. Yes. And a lot of the people that you see representing myths and twisting them don't tend to um, bother with the little details, I have noticed. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. 
<laughs> you, um, one, one of the interesting things about being in this field is you, you get sometimes, I don't know if criticism is the right word, but you get um, comments from people on social media saying, oh, this isn't right or this isn't right. And a lot of those times, those people are actually wrong. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, like people are conflating Greek mythology and Norse mythology when events and, you know, sometimes I, I try to educate and sometimes I just ignore it and say, okay, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's always fun dealing with the uh, magpies, I think they're called. Mm. But um, so moving a little bit sideways, as far as the writing process goes uh, from conception of idea to money in the bank, do you have a least favorite part? Oh, a least favorite part. Um, it's always a fun question to ask. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms. I am. Um, I guess I'm, I'm very far into the creative uh, side of the project. So the marketing and the managing of ads and the uh, doing all that, that kind of thing. Um, it's not my favorite thing. Uh, it, it's a thing that I've learned to do now and I'm, I'm continuing to try to learn to get better because, you know, when I, when I first started out as a publisher, um, I, I took lessons from my, um, my education, which was partly in traditional publishing. Right. And, and I thought it would be one way. And um, publishing has changed a lot in the time since then. And, and you're, the means of reaching readers and of going about things have changed. So, yeah, doing all that, it's, it's, it's not my most fun thing. I, I set one day a week um, where I don't do any creative work and I just, I have to deal with the always 10,000 tasks uh, involved in running the business. So six, six, six days a week I do creative work. Uh, one day a week I do um, all the stuff that I really don't want to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I think many of us are in that same position. Yeah, I've um, that I, I, I used to try to write all day and then do those things in the evening and I found that they would weigh me down to the point that my productivity was going down. So oh, yeah. it was better to just force them all onto one day that I could just have one day of, uh, oh my God, I have to do all this stuff. <laughs> oh so yeah. The other oh, yeah. days on, on being creative. That sounds like a pretty nice schedule. Usually, yeah. yeah. Usually, uh oh. Oh, I mean, there's, there's, there's always uh, interruptions. I mean, um, We've got a young child, and we just moved, and you know, there's always stuff that just uh, gets in the way. Yeah, life life gets in the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah life tends to do that. Uh, always, always fun. So, as far as other people in your genre, um, is there an author out there whose writing slash um, storytelling abilities you would like to steal? Oh, sure. Uh, I, I mentioned Guy Gabriel Kay. Mm -hmm. R. Scott Baker is maybe my favorite author out there. Um, Joe Abercrombie is really good. George R. R. Martin. Um, yeah, there, there, there's some others that, uh, yeah, I, I definitely uh, have a lot of authors that I admire a lot. I am, as far as doing exactly what I'm doing, I'm not aware of anybody doing that per se the closest i could think of was guy gabriel k yeah it won. but his, his stuff isn't it's not all connected so. no no that would be um yeah i'd have to think about that one i mean there are a lot of individual pieces of uh, mythologies in certain books and whatnot um i've seen a couple of retellings but nothing quite on your scale yeah, it um, it's kind of a massive project, uh, but I, I do tend to um, gobble up uh, other books about mythology when they're available. Sure. Usually, um, usually it, it's uh, Greek or or Norse. Uh, sometimes you can get some other mythologies, but usually I see a lot of Greek and Norse books. Uh, usually they're not linking the two together, but uh, that's that's just me, I guess. Um, 
But yeah, I just read uh, Cersei by Madeline Miller. And, oh uh, yeah, I've yeah. heard interesting things about that. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I haven't um, read it yet. It's on the list. So many books to read. I yes, I empathize. I'm I'm reading. Um, in order to get more time in the night, uh, I have more time in the day. I pretty much uh, read for a few hours every night, and mm-hmm. uh, just trying to get get through all this research material. Um, and uh, still, it's it's hard to even make a dent. I mean, uh, even if I'm finishing a book every few days, it still seems like there's hundreds on my list to read. So, I know that feeling very well. Oh yes. Okay, so going back to your series. Um, for each different era, are there characters that persist throughout, or are you telling individual myths that sort of skip characters or just happen to have them because they were in the original myth? Uh, are you asking if there's characters that persist uh, between eras or within an era? I don't think I phrased this properly. Persisting within an era, but also contributing to the overarching uh, story that you've got, and not just these characters happen to be in the same couple of myths, and so therefore they show up. Um, sure. Okay, so this uh, this is, um, the, I don't know, can you see that? This is the, the Apples of Eden, which is the first book of Gods of the Ragnarok era. Right. So um, the whole Gods of the Ragnarok era series is uh, about mostly from Odin's point of view. I mean, there, there's a lot of viewpoint characters, but Odin is sort of the main point of view character. Okay. Uh, and the series, uh, well, the whole Eschaton cycle focuses on uh, themes of um, fate and free will. Uh, uh, that yeah, particular yeah. series also focuses a lot on um, the relationship between two families, uh, Odin's family and his blood brother Loki's family. Mm-hmm. Um, and so those characters persist through that, and then they appear as um, minor characters. This is a, a side series that takes place in the middle about a shield maiden named Herber. So she's okay. a mortal, and these these other characters are immortal, um, and just kind of pop in and on occasion um, manipulate things behind the scenes, uh, <laughs> causing her to... Uh, well, she's on, a, she's on a quest for vengeance. She's... Um, a character from uh, what's called the Tierfing cycle, where she gets this um, cursed sword Tierfing, and uh, she decides she's going to um, avenge the murder of her father and uncles and all that. And um, well, yeah, yeah, quests for vengeance, you know, don't always end all that well. Mm, not usually. Uh, so this, the other series I have is um, Heirs of Mana. Mm-hmm. This, um, this is. Uh, a much earlier time period in the world uh, where the world is um, inundated and uh, there's just like a few um, islands uh, where people live. So a lot of the focus is on the ocean and um, mer kingdoms below the sea and that kind of thing. So you have um, in, in this series, the Polynesian series, you have the origins of a few uh immortal characters and a few uh, magical objects that later make an appearance in the Norse series. Ah, okay. Interesting. So there are overarching people that show up, but not necessarily as important as they could be, or as they are in each individual series. Yeah, um, each individual series tends to have its its own focal characters, and then there are uh, there are a few like truly immortal characters that um, seem to be persisting through the ages. Okay. Usually those are not the viewpoint characters, they're um, entities. And I don't want to get too spoilery with this no, stuff. No, no, no. But uh, yeah, there, there, there is a meta plot arcing over all the whole um, Eschaton cycle. Mm-hmm. This will be fun. Um, well, you know, I. In a perfect world, I, I at one point wanted to try to um, write all the, the different series simultaneously. Mm-hmm. But uh, that, I think, was going to prove too taxing at the moment. Um, I mean, it, it, it requires traveling to all these places to for research. Mm-hmm. 
yeah. Each series, like I said, requires months of research, and it just uh, it wasn't something that I could do right now. So right. I'm I'm trying to focus just on the Greek series and and get that out there the way I did with the Ragnarok series, and uh, you know go from there. And okay. Then next. Very fun. So, so I yeah I kind of have um, I have my my intentions for each of the different eras and what they're going to represent and how they relate to each other. Uh, but some of that's going to have to wait a few years for people to get to that. Oh, it'll, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. So as far as the sci-fi series, how is that going? Because I imagine that's rather um, different. Yeah, uh, that's... Um, I would say the only thing that I really have in, in common um, with that is, is my writing style and that I still pull in some of my philosophy background into it. Sure. Uh, but it, it tends to be, those books are shorter, faster paced, um, and uh, yeah, and because I write them with a collaborator, um, it's, a, it's a totally different experience. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of fun. We tend to get on um, uh, Zoom, which is like Skype, and mm -hmm. um, just uh, hash out back and forth the plot of, uh, you know, usually the whole series. Um, over over the course of a couple of weeks, and you know, once that's what's once that's down, then we both read whatever the other person wrote, and uh, it, it was a really fun process. So we actually we just um, released the final book in that collaboration in um, November, I think. Uh, so now there's a complete collection up. Um, so I don't manage any of those books; those are all managed by his company. Um, sure. I, I split out my fantasy and sci-fi uh, under two different pen names um, for um, branding reasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Some readers, some readers like both, and some readers don't. And I, I didn't want the Amazon algorithms recommending my sci-fi books to all my fantasy readers if that's not what they're into. Right. So, um, Amazon algorithms. <laughs> It's the world we live in. So uh, yeah, I, my yeah. sci-fi is under M. A. Larkin, and my um, uh, fantasy is under Matt Larkin. And I, I, that's enough that the algorithms don't get confused, and enough and close enough that hopefully the fans can figure out I'm the same person. Right. If they want. To. Yeah. Well, I mean, battling with Amazon is uh, a good portion of the marketing strategy these days. So if you can get people to figure it out, I think you're pretty solid. Yeah. So, yes, I have 17 sci-fi books out, actually. There's two series. One one is a five-book series and one is a 12-book series. Okay. Uh, and that that's fun. Um, Magical Scrivener, the publishing company that does that, um, is very much into audiobooks. And, and uh -huh. because of that, I've started moving my fantasies into audio, too. But uh, mm -hmm. the, the greatest number of their fans come in from audio. They, they love their audio. And it's been really interesting. I'm not an audio listener myself, uh, but I have listened to the performances that the guy has done for, for our stuff. And it was neat after writing it to hear uh, the voices that were given to some of the um, alien characters or, uh, you know, some of the um, goofier characters, you know, the... Uh, um, I don't know. He, he, uh, he does a good job of characterizing all the, all the different... Yeah. Yeah. Well, audio is a completely different style of, um, I want to say reading, but that's not entirely accurate. Performance, I suppose? Yeah, it's performance, yeah. Um, the narrator that I found for my, my Norse mythology series, and uh, the first three books are out, and the fourth book should be out any day now in audio. Ooh. The fifth book is being recorded now. Um, the narrator I found is from um, Sweden. He approached me, actually, and said he was interested. And he said, you know, I'm from Sweden, and, um, you know, I know how to pronounce these words. <laughs> and, that always and, helps. Yeah, and, and I said, okay, well, I, I wasn't currently planning to do audiobooks, but you know what, let's, uh, let's hear a sample. And I heard a sample, and it was just like... Um, my my friend Jeff, my co-author, he he said, uh, "Oh man, it's like uh, listening to a a, a scald and around a fireside at night, uh, you mm -hmm. know, a campfire, just hearing him tell it the way it was supposed to be, and all uh, that that just became that." So, <laughs> well, very fun. That's 
That's always fun. Oh, yeah. Narrators can make or break an audiobook. Yeah. Most definitely. Uh, So for people trying to get into your specific genre, and I'll focus on the mythology here, not the sci-fi, are there traps that they should avoid? You mean writers trying to get into it? Yeah, writers. Huh. Sure. I I, I could think of a lot of things. Uh, I mean, a lot of... uh, personal opinion stuff, a lot of it. I think one thing to remember with um, mythology is that the people in the ancient world um, didn't share modern sensibilities. They had a different way of interacting with the world, a different way of thinking about the world. And if you try to create characters uh, that feel like what we consider modern virtues, and, and constrain your characters to that, they're not going to be true to the myths and they're not going to be true to the, the cultures that you had, uh, that the, those myths came from. Mm-hmm. And um, we see, like if you look at the, the Marvel interpretations of uh, Thor and those characters, um, there, are, there are a couple of problems. Be- besides, never mind the fact that they've uh, changed a lot of things and made Loki Thor's brother and all that. <laughs> But also the the nature of the characters are more heroic than I think they really were um, in in myths. And for me, I mean, that is one of the reasons why my work is uh, falls into the grimdark category, where you know there's uh, there's moral ambiguity in what these people are doing. They're they're strong people, they're passionate people, and they're trying to do um, they're trying to do what they feel is necessary. Uh, But it's not always um, that their attitudes and their personalities and their their actions are not always things that seem heroic. Right. So, uh, you know, I've I've had uh, a reviewer say about the characters in uh, in, in Tides of Mana that you you don't always like them, but they're always interesting to follow because they are... um, uh, it's about uh, Tides of Mana is about three god queens uh, fighting over these islands, uh. and um, they're Oops. they're all extremely. Uh, th- they suffer from far too much pride and a willingness to uh, throw away the lives of um, other people that uh, like like they don't matter too much. And you know some of them maybe learn their lesson and some of them don't. But uh, you know from from the beginning there's these epic confrontations between uh, superpowered entities and um, it th- these are drawn basically straight out of uh, the Polynesian Hawaiian myths mm-hmm. uh, and if you look at it like that then I think it all makes sense and if you look at it from a modern um, perspective no these are, these are not people you would want to meet no they're not you, you wouldn't want to be friends with them and um, Sometimes uh, I, I see something like, oh, uh, this book has nobody to root for. And I think that may be missing the point that uh, you can you can root for a person and be interested even if they're not, um, even if they have serious flaws in their character. Yeah, that's how I tend to do it. But then I tend to like an antagonist more than I like a um, true hero in the protagonist sense. I, yeah, a lot of my work... That has um, tends to portray both sides. So w- without really establishing one or the other as right or wrong, or they're, they're different <laughs> sides of conflict. And, that sounds like huge amounts of trouble and fun. I think that would be yeah. Mm, I like it. So yeah, well, this has been great fun. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add, writing related or not writing related? Um, I I can't think of anything else. Thing I'm extremely interested in your series, and it's been great fun talking with you. Because how often do you get philosophy with mythology? <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate that.